So Tim, welcome back to Bryanston. Thank you. Uh, so you were here from 2000 to 2005. Yeah. And I'm guessing history was your, your thing. It was. Subject. It was. Um, but it only became, it was definitely my favourite subject, but I remember a hu- feeling huge liberation and sense of certainty when I decided that this was absolutely what I wanted to do at university and that it was what I was going to do at A-level, which probably happened around my AS level, so my no. penultimate year. So, um, bring us up to speed, what happened between 2005, Leavers Ball, and sitting here right now? Um, I had a year out and then I went to Oxford and studied history for three years, which I loved and uh, Bryanston was incredibly good at preparing me for because I think so much of what at least happened when I was here and I think still happens now is of being set assignments and having a week to do them was very much like doing your, and managing your time, like doing uh, essays at Oxford. And then after that, I went, I had a variety of incarnations, including one briefly as an actor, but then my main career before writing this book was as a journalist. I was a political journalist for Channel 4 News. Let's talk about this incredible book, Appeasing Hitler. Chamberlain, Churchill, and the road to war. Um, could you set the scene? So it's the early 30s, um, Baldwin is Prime Minister, and things are changing in Germany. Could you just um, introduce us to the, to the period? Yes, well, I mean, Stan- Stanley Baldwin is sort of de facto Prime Minister, but he's not Prime Minister for the very when Hitler actually comes to power because there's a, a national government. The enormous crisis caused by the Great Depression has meant that uh, the Labour government has fallen, but a, a rump of Labour MPs led by Ramsay MacDonald have remained in power and formed a coalition with the much larger Conservatives. So Ramsay MacDonald remains in power, but Stanley Baldwin is de facto Prime Minister. The scene in Britain is one which is incredibly pacific. I mean, people do not want to have any idea of going to war again for very understandable reasons. Uh, over a million British and Commonwealth soldiers died during the First World War, and that was only a mere 12 years ago. And the desire, I think, actually to avoid war increased between the years 1928 and 1933 because of the publication of so many now very famous tomes and plays and films like All Quiet on the Western Front, uh, Siegfried Sassoon's Memoirs of an Infantry Officer, uh, Vera Britain's Testament of Youth, and this sort of added to this sense of pacifism. So, even if people were becoming aware, which they were, of uncomfortable events in Germany, the idea that we were ever going to have to go to war again with the same enemy was just unconscionable. And a lot of this book focuses on the, the sort of internal opinions of Britain, a government which is very aware of what the people think, and a media who desperately want to promote a sort of pacific approach. Um, Do you think it it caused great strain and pressure on British government having to see the Treaty of Versailles and all all the um, things which Germany had to obey being slowly broken? I don't think it did. I think one of the things I found shocking doing this book is for much of the decade you didn't feel that the government felt that they were in crisis. And one thing which I haven't been able to go into in the book is the uh, many other things that they were trying to do. There's a, Churchill is engaged for much of the first part of the 30s in a huge row about self-government for India. And then there's uh, Neville Chamberlain introducing a system of, impi- as Chancellor of the Exchequer, introducing a system of imperial preference uh, for uh, uh, putting tariffs on the outside of the British Empire. It was so unattractive, the idea of another war, that I think they didn't want to think about it. And they didn't want to, it's not just that it's unattractive, but it's, unattra- it's unattractive both for the cost in human life terms, but also in economic terms. Britain is dealing with the Great Depression as well. Uh, there's a huge uh, budget deficit, and any idea that we're going to spend a huge amount of money on arms is, uh, is as politically unappealing as it is financially unappealing. And yet men such as Churchill uh, seem to be quite an early voice in saying we must rearm. Uh, well, what do you think led them to see the danger which others didn't see or didn't want to see, perhaps? I think it helps that Churchill is not in the government, that if you, if you are in opposition, you are, have a greater freedom of action. I also think that it's Churchill's sense of history which allows him to identify the great danger that the Nazis pose. On the one hand, the Nazis are something entirely new, 
And Churchill is very good at identifying this, uh, that this, this racialism is something that has not really been in European politics beforehand, and he is, he is a great defender of uh, the Jews and is very aghast by the German persecution of the Jews. But at the same time, he realizes that British policy, as a historian, not a very good, not a historian that we would read now, except for his wonderful prose, that British foreign policy has had one aim in mind for centuries, and that is to prevent any one single power dominating the continent. And that's why we opposed the ambitions of Louis XIV in the 17th century, why we opposed the ambitions of the French revolutionary governments and Napoleon in the 18th and 19th centuries, why we opposed the Kaiserreich at the beginning of the 20th century, and where eventually that's the reason why we opposed the Third Reich. It's not to do with the rights or wrongs of the Treaty of Versailles or the uh, German minorities that Hitler wanted to incorporate into the Reich. It's about whether or not you could allow one power to dominate the continent. So if the power balances off, Britain tends to intervene? Has done, uh, ha had always done historically, and particularly if there's anything that is going to threaten the uh, France and the Low Countries from which uh, an invasion could be launched, and much more seriously after the First World War and developments in the aeroplane uh, through fr airfields from which uh, foreign bombers could attack this otherwise fairly impenetrable island. Um, so, so as Hitler came to power, and uh, everyone knows a bit about the techniques and the oppression that Hitler used, it's quite incredible how many British people who are not, do not have any authority, go over to Hitler, speak to Hitler, you have a chapter tea with Hitler, uh, and they just, they, they talk to him and they come back and all of them say almost exactly the same thing, which is Hitler does not want war. What led these private individuals to go and investigate and then come to a conclusion which with hindsight seems um, a bit foolish? So I think what led them to investigate is a, is a, a large mixture of things. I, th I think this is completely fascinating, by the way. It's one of the things that I most wanted to explore in the book and uh, is, is different to the narrative of just the Churchill-Chamberlain uh, rivalry, etc. The, these amateur diplomats who, as you say, had no official position and no encouragement from the government. In fact, the Foreign Office were despairing of these people who were muddying the waters of diplomacy. I think the one reason they do it is their very genuine desire to avoid another war, and there is a sense that if only we could show the Germans that we wanted to be friends with them, that it would be so. Secondly, a lot of these people are personally motivated to do it because they are not enjoying political power themselves. And the Nazis, thanks in large part to these amateur diplomats, get a completely warped idea of British politics. They think that we are still an aristocratic oligarchy in which the royal family still holds significant political power, and if only you can develop good relations with these aristocrats and leading members of society, then an Anglo-German alliance could come about. And this is nonsense. The, the government pays absolutely no attention to these amateur no. diplomats going up, but the Nazis do. So that's one, and, and they're incredibly flattered by it. I mean, people like the Duke of Buccleuch, for instance, he goes out a number of times, he's a figure who hasn't really been written about much before and whose papers I got to see for the first time, um, they've been previously locked up. He visits Germany every year between 1933 and 1939. Now, he's not a vastly intelligent man, he's a, a decent man, he's a patriotic man, he fought in the First World War in the trenches, sees all his friends being killed, but he can't get any, uh, he has no real political power, and although members of the government will write to him, nobody's going to put him in the cabinet, as they might have done, the, a serious landed interest might have done beforehand. But you could go out to Germany and you could get a meeting with Hitler or a leading member of his regime incredibly easily. You did not have to be uh, at all important to get a meeting. So I think these people were flattered by the attention that they received right. by the Nazis. And then as to your second question, how did they come back and have such what we would now consider an incredibly naive view of Adolf Hitler. Well, it wasn't just to the German people that Hitler was incredibly persuasive. And he, his public and private utterances throughout this period are, are that he is a man of peace. He says, I, was, I fought in the First World War myself. I would never, ever want to have another war. And particularly, and this, is, I think, from at least up until the end of 1937, he was sincere about, 
he wants an Anglo-German friendship. He right. sees no point in fighting the British. He thinks that the Kaiser's great mistake was to initiate a naval race with the British. These are our natural allies. They are kin to us racially. We, the British Empire is a force for stability and civilization in the world. Our enemy is Bolshevism and the Asiatic race. And this is a similar view that the British held as well. You, did, you talked about actually how a lot of people in Britain, despite the events of the First World War, were more naturally um, worried about the French and French power than the Germans. And um, do you think that that might contribute to how people were so keen to overlook uh, events in Germany and see Hitler as a reformer and someone who brings the country together as unemployment went right down mm -hmm. and, and this country which had previously been devastated by war um, was seemed to be on the rise? Yes, the anti-French feeling is extraordinary. It's important to qualify that it's not, there's no fear that the French are ever going to attack us. In, at the end of the 1920s when Britain is clearly in financial straits, the defence chiefs have to make a decision to say we have to rule out France as, as and America really as foes. We have to assume politically that these two countries are never going to, because we can't possibly prepare ourselves to fight them. France is so close and America is so powerful. Where they, their frustration and anti-French feeling comes is the idea that the French have behaved very badly towards the Germans. They insisted on the most punitive form of peace at Versailles, which, by the way, modern historians, I think, disagree about, uh, and I, I'm with them on that. They then refused to, in any way, adjust the treaty while the Weimar Republic still survives. And it's their unwillingness to adjust this treaty that breeds this nationalism which leads to the birth of Nazis. So, and that, and that continues into the 30s. So the British find, are incredibly frustrated and annoyed with the French and consider the French a danger to peace purely because they think it is the French, French intransigence that is pushing Hitler to, uh, along this radical agenda. So you touched on the Treaty of Versailles and the French approach to it. It's something which a lot of people study uh, here at Branson and GCSE. Um, how much do you think that was responsible for the rise of Hitler? and his policies, without the Treaty of Versailles being as strict as it was, do you think the um, political landscape in Germany would have facilitated the rise of the National Socialists? Well, it's uh, fascinating and sort of the million dollar question. I think the Treaty of Versailles was not nearly as punitive as people claim, or certainly as the Germans claimed at the time. The, they did not pay the vast majority of their reparations. They were uh, made uh, pretty much null and void, and that the Americans had given them vast loans to allow them to, to pay them before, and nor were serious chunks of their territory hacked off. The, the peace that the Allies imposed on the Germans at the end of the First World War was not nearly as bad as the peace that the Germans would have imposed on the Allies had they won, but nevertheless the sense of grievance was an incredibly powerful political weapon which Hitler was able to Use. But how important is it? Well, the Treaty of Versailles doesn't get, doesn't change between 1918 and 1933, and the Nazis don't do terribly well during most of that period. In fact, the Weimar Republic by the end of the 20s is doing extremely well. It's only once the Great Depression hits that the Nazis start to do well. So I don't think we could claim that the Treaty of Versailles itself is responsible for the rise of the Nazis or the Second World War. Uh, so, of course, central to this period is Chamberlain. Uh, who fancies himself as quite a um, master of foreign affairs. And you use the phrase flirtations with dictators, and he seemed to be flattered by talking to them and enjoy speaking to Mussolini and Hitler. Do you think he really felt he had a grip on these men? He did. Chamberlain deceives himself that he is a master of diplomacy and that your own charm and negotiating skills can somehow trump national interest. And that, this is not, by the way, a defect that is unique to Chamberlain. I think if you look at more recent things, David Cameron thought that his own admittedly very good relationship with Angela Merkel would cause her to give him greater concessions in his renegotiation with the European Union prior to the referendum here. But th this is always a myth. No, very rarely do personal relations between leaders Trump national interests, even when it, we can say that very good relations between world leaders do have positive effects, like uh, uh, Ronald Reagan and Mikhail Gorbachev, or Margaret Thatcher and uh, Mikhail Gorbachev, 
the end of the Cold War does not come and come about because of this good relation. It helps, but it comes about because Gorbachev has decided to pursue policies uh, of, of detente with the West and perestroika and glasnost and all these things are good things for Russia and for yeah. the Soviet Union. It is not because he gets on well with Margaret Thatcher. Chamberlain doesn't like Hitler. He doesn't really know Mussolini so well. He doesn't like Hitler when he meets him, but he flatters himself that he has somehow got a hold over him and that Hitler is impressed by him and would not deceive him and that once his word has been given that this is something that would not be broken. And that is his greatest delusion. There's that wonderful quote towards the end of the book, and of course it's all coming down around Chamberlain's ears. And he says, um, after Mussolini invades Albania in April 1939, that such faith as I ever had in the assurances of dictators is rapidly being whittled away. And it's such a sort of, you know, as, as if you should ever have faith in, in dictators. Uh, do you think this is a, a revealing quote when it comes to his naivety? I think it is, but I think also what we have to remember is being a dictator does not have the same connotations as it does today. The reason we really hate dictators is because of this one man, Hitler, and this other man, so Joseph, Sta theory, Joseph Stalin. It. Yeah, this is the age of dictators. Obviously, there have been dictators in the ancient world, and there had been. But democracy is a very new thing. The franchise had only been made universal in the early 1920s. And Chamberlain, although a Democrat, certainly had no dictatorial pretensions, is, is an extremely authoritarian Democrat within his own party and within his own cabinet. Uh, I, don't, and I don't think that there is the same revulsion, a priori revulsion at dictatorships in the 30s right. that there is today. There is a revulsion, don't get me wrong. People think that, these, that parliamentary democracy is a much better system. And, but even Churchill says, there, there, are, there are differences, and he would have supported the fascist coup in Italy had he been there, because it protected Italy from turning Bolshevik. So it, it's not the same, uh, quite, but nevertheless, it's not so much that they're dictators, it's what sort of dictators there are. There are quite a lot of dictators. There is a dictator in Yugoslavia, there are, dictator, there are dictators or absolutist monarchs or revolutionary, deeply insidious regimes in large parts of the world. It's the fact that these are dictators who are determined to rip up the uh, international law book and embark on a policy of uh, territorial expansion. That's where the danger comes. Right. Uh, so, during this period, there is there's very little happiness in government. There's Eden and Chamberlain's power struggles, Eden as um, foreign secretary. Do you think that Chamberlain's odd techniques, such as using his, uh, his sister-in-law, isn't it, who is mm. speaking to Mussolini, and his discussion to Mussolini, almost she shows Mussolini ex extracts from letters. And is that, do you think, an appropriate way for Chamberlain to have been conducting his sort of influence, his foreign policy, through sort of secret odd little means. No, I think it's an absolutely appalling way, and something that's happened in Britain much more recently, but it ha certainly happened now, is with disastrous effects, is the undermining of the Foreign Office and official Foreign Office advice. I think Britain has traditionally had a very high standard of diplomats and professional opinion, and undermining them by going behind their back and sending letters to your sister-in-law, which she's going to show to Mussolini, just played into Mussolini's hands, and it's allowed Mussolini and the Italian government to manipulate Chamberlain. So, yes, it, it's underhand, and it's certainly counterproductive to Britain's interests, even though Chamberlain thinks at the time that he's playing a blinder on this. Right. Um, so back to odd subversive sort of techniques, there's a, Sir Joseph Ball is a character yeah. um, hanging around at this time. Do you think the political sort of espionage and secret endeavours of him facilitated the continuation of Chamberlain's appeasement policy? I think it helped, just in case people don't know who Sir Joseph Ball is. Jo Joseph Ball was the director of the Conservative Research Department. He'd been a spy in the First World War for MI5. And he then sort of becomes Chamberlain's in-house spy, a rather shady political fixer who manipulates the press and buys in, with Conservative Party funds in 1938 a newspaper called Truth and turns it into a Tory propaganda sheet. But it's not just a Tory propaganda sheet, it's a Tory slander sheet. It is filled with anti-Semitic abuse against ministers like Leslie Horbelisha and even implying that Churchill is 
in some way in hock to uh, the Jewish lobby, as, as it's described in this. I, d I don't think he has a huge influence. I think the, the bit most important point is that Chamberlain enjoys a massive majority, so he doesn't have to employ all of these underhand tricks, but he nevertheless does. He, he, he is not a man who likes to have his opinions in any way questioned. He is dogmatic. I, there's, one, there's one quote which I, is in the book from one of Chamberlain's letters to his sisters, and he quotes the Earl of Chatham, one of our greatest war leaders, saying, I know that I am the only person that can save the country, which is an incredibly arrogant thing to say. And interestingly, it's the quotation used at the very front of Margaret Thatcher's ghost-written memoirs, the Downing Street years. And I then put in a footnote, but then cut it out later because people told me I needed to substantiate this more and I didn't want to go <laughs> off down this, that Neville Chamberlain and Margaret Thatcher were incredibly similar figures, and I think very similar prime ministers. And neither of them would have liked that comparison at all. Chamberlain actually had a strong social conscience and did not believe in laissez-faire and would have found Mrs. Thatcher's uh, sort of crackpot home economics um, infuriating. And she would have hated what she regarded as his weakness and pusillanimity to dictators. But nevertheless, I think they were incredibly similar. One of the reasons being their, this incredible dogmatism, this huge self sense that I am right and everyone else is wrong and I don't want to listen to alternative views or have uncomfortable facts intrude upon my world view. Uh, so with the press, which was so important um, to politics at the time, how do you think that has really changed today? Do you think that if this, if they had the technologies that we have today of the internet and instant messaging, how different would it be for the government? to project their vision? And do you think they'd get more criticism more quickly? Absolutely, no, without a shadow of a doubt. Not only are most of the big papers slavishly loyal to the government and very supportive of its anti-war stance, oh. they're owned by very rich press barons who don't want to go to war because war is going to affect their fortunes, but there is actually collusion between the government and the BBC and the newspapers to toe the line. There, there are all sorts of instances of the book of government ministers going to newspaper barons and saying, you can't say this, can you please stop criticising these dictators, you're making our work so much harder. They manage to pull BBC broadcasts, they are able to stop certain people broadcasting on the BBC. Not that the BBC has any desire to uh, rock the boat at this time anyway. The Director General, Sir John Rees, is a devout admirer of fascism in Italy and uh, in Germany and has no desire to uh, give a platform to anti-appeasement voices during this period. So if there was social media at that time, this time I think it would make it an awful lot harder for the government, not least because the tales and atroc of atrocities from Germany and instances with the reportage of German military preparations would have been so much more immediate. It's there, it's a myth to say that people at this time were not aware of the nasty things that were going on in Germany, but the ability to see it via film, via tweets, would, would have had a hugely powerful effect. One of the things that shocked me uh, was not only how long appeasement went on for. You know, you think, God, he's got to stop this policy now, yeah. and then I'd be another 150 pages in, and he was still trying for it. But also how they got away, in a sort of general sense, with doing things such as betraying Czechoslovakia. The, the government, the French and the British, almost turned their backs on a whole country, leaving them, leaving them to the sort of to Nazi um, to the right, really. How do you think they managed to, to tell themselves that was the right thing to do? They managed to tell themselves the right thing to do because an even worse thing than betraying this country in Eastern Europe, Czechoslovakia, would be to allow for the destruction of British cities and unimaginable loss of life. And this, I think, is for two very important points. Firstly, that projections of the Second World War whenever it came, and if it came, it's not just that they think, my God, we're going to have songs and passion tales again, but it's going to be much, much worse. Because of the aeroplane, we are going to see the complete and near instant destruction of whole cities. And that actually turned out to be a massive inflation of the potential for aircraft to wreak damage. Even Churchill said that 44,000 casualties a week would occur 
in London once bombing began. In fact, that is the total number of casualties that occurred throughout the entire Blitz. But people, every, most people thought that this would happen straight away. It would almost be like a nuclear attack, that right. these whole cities would go. So you, the decision of peace or war is far more critical than it ever was at any other period in our history, because it can attack the home front, it can attack civilians, and your entire country could be destroyed very, very swiftly. So you must only go into it if it is, if your absolute national security is threatened and if there is overwhelming need. And they did not think, frankly, that there was overwhelming need to prevent three and a quarter million ethnic Germans from joining the Reich. It's a betrayal of Czechoslovakia, but it's upholding the principle espoused by President Wilson at the Paris Peace Conference of 1918-19, which is of self-determination, that these people, if they want to join with their compatriots within the Third Reich, they should be allowed to. It might not be a terribly nice thing, but are we going to really go to war to stop them? Are we really going to allow the destruction of London? So I think that that's how they sell it themselves. So we all know that the war kicks off over Poland in the end. And there's this wonderful part where Hitler's got all his men marching to the border and then he realises that actually perhaps the French and the British aren't bluffing when they say they will step in. And so he pulls it off for about five days. Uh, do you think that if that policy of, if he had believed that they weren't bluffing earlier on and they hadn't been appeasing him so much, that really would have stopped him earlier? That's a big question here. Yeah, it, it, it's a huge question. I think that there are, that is one instance, and there's another instance in the Czech crisis where Hitler gets cold feet because he thinks that the Allies are in, are in earnest. And this supports the view that it would have been possible to deter him by saying that we would have gone to war with him had he embarked on any certain policy. I think ultimately it would have been very hard, certainly by 1938, to have avoided any sort of war. And then it becomes an argument, the argument about appeasement becomes an argument about when do you go to war? When is the propitious moment to choose to go to war rather than can you avoid it? But he certainly could have been faced down and one of the great problems, or certainly had the capacity to be faced down, at least to delay the attack on Poland. And one of the great problems with the Munich Agreement and appeasement up to March 1939 is that it convinces Hitler that the French and the British will always give in, that they will always sacrifice these countries in Eastern Europe, as long as he doesn't march west. I don't think he thinks that he could ever march west and not be embroiled in war with the British and the French, but he doesn't think that they're seriously going to risk their own destruction for Poland or for Czechoslovakia. Uh, so do you think the Second World War, as, Hitler put, as Churchill put it, sorry, was truly an unnecessary war? Could it have been prevented? Well, it might, this might sound like it's uh, a bit pedantic, but I, I think Churchill uses the wrong word here. Unnecessary. It was not an unnecessary war. It was an incredibly necessary war oh. once it began. It was the most necessary war we've ever fought in our history. But that, that I don't think is what Churchill means. What he means is avoidable. Yes, um, avoidable. And I think, yes, I'm not a determinist. I think that um, everything is avoidable and nothing's inevitable until it happens. But there becomes moments at which it becomes increasingly likely to almost inevitable. And the big problem with this period are the, the moments at which the Second World War could have avoided, been avoided are much earlier in the decade when there is even less support for any sort of interventionist policy against Germany and even fewer resources, both military and financial, with which the Western powers can do it. And there is this mantra which is repeated at the time, which has a certain logic, but is ultimately disastrous, which is that a war avoided for a day could be a war avoided permanently. Mm. If, I, if I go to war now, then there will definitely be a war, but if I push it off for a week, something might turn up. And it doesn't work out like that because they misunderstand the determination of Hitler to have a war and to pursue his policy of uh, aggrandizement for a, a greater Germany, but there is a certain logic in trying to avoid it for as long as possible. Do you think Chamberlain's policy of appeasement would have been the same had Baldwin decided to start rearming in the early 30s, particularly in the air? Yes, I do. I think there's a lot of testament and bits which I quoted in my book that says that 
Britain's deficiencies in arms weighed very heavily with Neville Chamberlain and with other people, but this was not the reason for appeasement. It was not due to British weakness. It was because he ultimately believed that war was a dreadful thing, which even Churchill, everyone would agree with, but such a dreadful thing that it should be avoided at all costs. He was virtually on the, within the pacifist camp that uh, he was so opposed to war. And secondly, that there was a means of avoiding it through diplomacy. He continually says that he, take, he takes Hitler at his public, at his word, vis-a-vis -vis his public decla declarations, to say that Austria is my last demand, the Sudetenland is my last demand. Well, if this is his last demand, we should just, just let him have it, because it's his last demand. Mm -hmm. um, he fails to realise that Hitler's made many last demands beforehand, or fails to remember this. So his conviction that diplomacy could reduce the number of Britain's enemies and prevent another war was absolute, and even if British power had been considerably greater by the time he becomes Prime Minister in May 1937, I think he would have pursued the same policy. Uh, so your book goes right up to the outbreak of war in the first eight months of war, um, the incredibly quiet period. And in fact, there are no great victories in World War II which you, you cover, because you end almost on Dunkirk, which I suppose in itself is quite an, a miracle, because they re rescued so many thousands more than they predicted to. But do you think there was this moment where actually when they went to war, they almost didn't want to fight it at all. So they just kept the blockades up, they sent the navy out, and they held everything back. Yes, I think there's a lot of that. There's a lot of wanting to avoid it. But also it's British strategy. It's the idea that we can outlast the Germans. The Germans, one of the reasons they've been behaving the way they have, it's not just for glory and a war for revenge, it's because they lack the natural resources to sustain themselves. Whereas we are a maritime power and enjoy the resources of the world's largest empire. So there's an idea that we can outlast the Germans. And Chamberlain starts writing these incredibly optimistic, ludicrously optimistic letters to his sisters, thinking that the war will be over by the spring because mm. the blockade is going to bring Germany to its knees. It took four years in the First World War to bring, and a far more effective blockade, to bring Germany to the point of starvation. So the idea that it could have occurred between 1939 and uh, September 1939 and May 1940 is completely far-fetched, particularly after the Nazi-Soviet pact when Hitler was receiving these enormous supplies of grain, of timber, of oil from the Soviet Union. So it, it's a combination of these two things. I think, though, ultimately there couldn't have been a very different strategy. Not only was there a distinct lack of resources. There was a huge idea that we had to catch up with Germany in the arms race, and it was to our benefit to not take the offensive because we're gradually, we're now finally producing Spitfires and Hurricanes mm. and anti tank guns at a terrific rate, but also that there is just not the will in either Britain or France to embark on an offensive against Germany, which Tactically, might have been a mistake because the vast majority of the German army was engaged on the Eastern Front, but it's never something that ever seriously crosses anyone's mind. So tell me about your research. You get into the private letters of Chamberlain to his sisters, in George VI's diaries. How did you access these incredibly exclusive and sometimes brand new, newly revealed sort of pieces? Well, I have to confess that the Chamberlain letters are all published, so I, I can't, um, and they're absolutely fascinating. He didn't keep a diary, but these letters serve the purpose of the diary. To him, where he, wrote, he wrote one a week on a Sunday to each of his two spinster sisters, and he alternated between the two. <laughs> the, and they read them, they read them together, and he's, he, he knew how incredibly discreet they were, so he's very frank in them, and they are, and they are incredibly uh, revealing. I did... Uh, a huge amount of research on almost every person who appears in the book who's a major figure that most of their archives are connected to institutions. So the Chamberlain Papers, where there are, there's such a huge resource there that I spent weeks and weeks there in Birmingham. He was uh, MP for Birmingham, Birmingham's the Chamberlain stronghold, going through all this stuff. The more, even more interesting stuff is going to places which are not open to the public because there's an even greater chance of finding new things. You can find new things in public archives, in universities and the National Archives just because there is so much material that people miss things and there are things people haven't looked at. And secondly, because what you're looking for may be different to what other people are looking for. 
but it's generally harder to find new things then. Whereas if you go to a private house and discover some trunk or minimum room which it has rarely been open, as I was lucky enough to do with the Buclu papers wow. or the papers of Alec Douglas Hume in Scotland, who was uh, obviously Prime Minister in the 60s briefly, but was Neville Chamberlain's parliamentary private secretary throughout the latter half of the 30s. Or someone uh, down here in Dorset, there's a, the grandson of a Tory MP called uh, Captain Charles Waterhouse, and he had in his cellar he, this man's diary, which is uh, in really damp condition. I said, you've got to, put, got to, it's got, got to fall apart, you need to put this somewhere better. And it, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing. The great joy of doing this research was that everyone wrote beautifully, and almost everyone kept a diary. And reading these diaries is a pleasure in itself. And there's nothing dry about them. It's, they read like Evelyn War novels. And that's one of the things I was thinking, I was saying, um, I was thinking about earlier, is that everyone seemed to write so intelligently and humorously. They described each other with such frank, hilarious detail. Um, I am concerned that if you were researching this period now, in 70 years, you might not find that. People don't write notes to self. No. They simply shoot it off to other people, what they mean, and they don't keep their personal opinions written down. Do you think we're looking, you were looking at the last period where this sort of honesty about other people in, in the political landscape was possible to you know, view? I don't think it's the last period. I think it's the golden period. I think other people kept renowned diaries, Tony Benn in later years, and Alan Clark and things like that. But the digital age, you're completely right, has um, destroyed that. People don't have time now. People, it's not part of our culture to keep diaries. If people do keep diaries in politics, it's generally for commercial reasons now. They think of it as their pension, like uh, Alistair okay. Campbell describes writing his diaries as his pension. And if you're writing so consciously for posterity and for uh, commercial reasons, you're far less likely to be honest about it. I mean, that's not to say that people, some of the characters I write about, didn't think that their diaries would one day be published, but most of them knew that they were only going to be published after they died, and they weren't doing it for their own concerned. financial gains. But yes, it will be incredibly difficult to write the history of Brexit and current political events in the same way. The only hope is to, as say someone like Tim Shipman has done, is to go into a ton of interviews with the characters immediately after. You've got to be, be more of a journalist at the time rather than a historian because there isn't going to be that paper trail. Right. Um, so before you wrote this book, you were working, was it in Channel 4? The Channel 4 News. Can you tell us a bit about that? Yeah, well, it was uh, an amazing place. I always revered Channel 4 News, the sort of self-proclaimed broadsheet of news, and it gets to be like that because it's an hour rather than half an hour. And I was working in history documentaries before I was there, and the company I was working for then said, well, you're very interested in politics. Would you like to work for a dispatches, one of these uh, current affairs programs that go on Channel 4 News? And this was a dispatches which you may not remember because I don't know, it must have happened about five years ago, but there was a time when uh, the then chief whip, Andrew Mitchell, got into an awful lot of trouble for allegedly calling the police in Downing Street um, plebs. And he was forced to resign eventually for that. And the dispatches I worked on had got the CCTV of this encounter and also had managed to discover that one of the crucial supposed witnesses to this encounter was not a tourist, as he claimed, but was in fact a member of the Metropolitan Police who had done this to fit him up. So it, was, it sort of exonerated Mitchell, but then later he rather overcooked it by um, suing the son and losing his libel action. Anyway, this was quite a big story at the time and it made the lead item on Channel 4 News and as a result of working on that with their star political reporter, Michael Crick, I got asked if I would like to go and work for Channel 4 News, which I very much did, and I worked there mainly covering politics as then Michael's producer for the next, well, I was Michael's producer for three years and I, had, um, I did general stuff for my first year there. And then you decided to leave to focus solely on this book. Yeah, it, it was quite 
quite a big change. It was a, it was a big change. I started writing the book though and researching the book, and I got the di- while I was still there. I I absolutely loved my time. I got to do it was. Uh, another golden age, I think, of political reporting. I got to do two, cover two general elections and two national referendums in Scotland and the European Union. And I travelled the whole of the country and visited towns and cities which ordinarily people don't go to for holidays. And so I got to, even if I'm badly travelled outside the UK, I now feel I'm fairly well travelled in the UK. And that was really interesting and they were very exciting contests to cover. But after, after you've done it for a while, you sort of get the sense that you know what you're doing. You know how to put a... The story is always changing, but you know how to put a piece together. You know who you need to interview. You know how to try and... There's always a huge desire to try and make television more interesting. How are we going to cover this election? How are we going to do this? Which generally revolves around modes of transport. Oh, well, we're going to send him in a hot air balloon around Britain or because we've done the caravan last time and we've, whatever it is. And I wanted to, a new challenge, and this uh, I've always wanted, always wanted to write a history book, and this idea came to me, and so I started to research it and write it while I was at Channel 4 News, but then it just wasn't going to get done. Brexit happened, the, the political reporting became even more strenuous, and there was no way I was going to be able to write all of this book while doing the day job. Researching this period in the 30s, of course, we are quite detached, so emotionally we're not so involved. And if that was um, all pacifist, sort of British um, opinion, how do you think we would look back on today and this um, decade in 70 years? Well, it would be very nice to think that in 70 years we will think that all our doubts and turmoil were worth it and uh, unfounded and that we were about to enter a new age of uh, prosperity and it's very depressing to be a young person well, I still like to think I'm a young person but you're an even younger person to, to say that oh we're going to look back and say that this was the beginning of the end but I think that the chances are we will look back on this as a disastrous time for our country and for the, the world and that the Western liberal order is under serious threat and that it is going to lead to a reduction in opportunities, in prosperity, a lowering of political discourse, even if Brexit and everything else turns out eventually to be a great success, which I severely doubt. Nobody can deny that we've lost a huge period of time where nothing else can get done because we're arguing about this and we're arguing about it in a way that has lowered our discourse, has reduced trust in politics, has made our country I think more divided than at any time since the 30s which I write about. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm sorry, I did not write this book in any way with a view to what's happening now. I got the deal to write and had the idea to write it before we'd left the European Union and before Donald Trump was elected president. Uh, the only thing I thought as these then events happened, which from a personal view I thought were disasters for our country and the world, was that it might make my book a bit more relevant. So that was the only tiny silver lining I could take from it. But I, it, it's, it's very difficult to see how all of this will lead to a, a place where a large section of our country is not at least going to feel betrayed and mm. left behind. In that way, actually, there are some similarities in the 1930s, that there is such a sort of polarisation of feeling. Um, I mean, it sort of took the Second World War to pull people together behind, behind that. I don't think we want war now. But do you think without the Second World War, people would have felt very polarised about fascism in Europe from, from a British perspective? I think that's a really interesting question. I think it could have occurred if the end of the policy had just been Munich and for some reason Hitler then took over the rest of Czechoslovakia but then stopped there and hadn't carried on, there would have been this on-running debate about, as to whether or not we'd betray Czechoslovakia and whether this was noble or not we, because we sort of are able to wipe our consciences clear about what went on at Munich by the fact that we then stood alone against fascism in 1940. But the big difference between then and now is people were divided, but they were divided at different times. Opinions swung very much against appeasement 
after Kristallnacht, but then even more after Hitler invaded the rest of Czechoslovakia in March 1939, you didn't have a sort of 50-50 divide, which is what, or a 52-48 divide, which could go either way now, as you have in this country. People were generally very pro-appeasement and pro-peace, and then they were very anti-appeasement, still pro-peace, but realising that it was unlikely to happen and a uh, facing of realities had to occur. It's more at the high level of politics, but even then, it's, it's the anti appeasers number about 30. It's, it's not the same half and half that we have in this country today. Are you concerned that the characters um, in this period of history they are. They tend to be from the upper parts of society. There's a lot of lords. There's a lot of uh, well, knights do politics, I suppose. Um, but it's, it's of course a conservatively dominated government. Do you think that we um, that it ignores when looking back on this period of history this, the common voice of the working classes? Well, you c could say that. I don't think. I mean, I don't think it does because I think. It's certainly trying to, at the beginning parts, lay the groundwork of what was guiding political action, which is the spirit of pacifism, and how did that manifest itself? Well, it manifested itself through uh, by-elections, like the Fulham East by-election in early 1934, uh, February 1934, I think, uh, the Oxford motion that the Oxford Union said that they were not going to fight for this king in this country. There was the peace ballot, where, which involves 11.8 million people. There is not a, a ready-made means until the invention of mass observation, which I quote in the latter half of the book, and mass observation began, I think, around 1937. There is not a ready-made means of gathering the opinions of what you call the common man or common woman. And it is very important, but it becomes slightly less important as, as time goes on. The, the, there is not, it's not direct democracy, and however, important public opinion is, and it is important, it's even less influential in diplomacy, where you're dealing between an ambassador and a foreign officer. There are very few of these exchanges are even revealed in Parliament. Parliamentarians might know what's going on because they have discussions behind the scenes, but it is, it's a book, it is a book which is to do with high politics, but it is the last moment, I think, at which a very small group of people were able to have a decisive influence not only on our country's history but on world history. Um, thank you so much for coming today and talking to me. No. Um, welcome back to Barnston. It's a great pleasure to be here and this is the room in fact where I studied for my history A levels and where you know if where I had well no I wouldn't say it all kicked off because that sounds grand but I mean where if I hadn't been studying this room none of this would have happened. Brilliant well thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.